Unit 10, Political, Territorial, and Legal Issues. Uh, this is where we get to the nitty gritty of a lot of the issues and problems in getting urban agriculture started in certain areas. Politics generally consists of a bunch of people who definitely don't have the same goals in mind, trying to do what's best for the community, but generally ending up what's doing what they think is best for a portion of the community. So politics and agriculture don't seem like they go together, but in fact, since the dawn of time, they have. Um, and even with all the practical problems of land availability, growing conditions, crop selection, scaling, security, inputs and outputs, um, dealing with the political side of things can sometimes be the most daunting task facing urban farmers, particularly if you're growing food for sale. Less of an issue if you're growing the food for your own personal consumption, but if you're growing it for sale, this can be a big issue. And so we're going to look at some of the issues, uh, political issues, legal issues, um, territorial issues facing urban agriculture in this unit. Let's take a look at the ways uh, politics ha affect urban agriculture, um, typically uh, in terms of restrictions. We'll take a look at some types of ordinances that may restrict urban agriculture. Okay, a law is something that's generally passed by the federal government or the state government. An ordinance is essentially a law passed by your local municipality. And that is the place where most of the conflict between urban agriculture uh, and government takes place is more on the local level. Some types of things that you run into are bans on beekeeping, for instance. Uh, bans on livestock keeping, um, restrictions on the location of vegetable gardens, ordinances against so-called unkempt appearances, uh, and we'll talk about why that's an issue, watering restrictions, processing facility requirements, and that one turns out to be a big issue for a lot of uh, urban farmers, um, and environmental regulations. Um, there are lots more potential points of conflict or uh, areas in need of education, I would say. Um, but these seem to comprise the largest group that you'll be dealing with. Let's take a look at some of these beekeeping bans. For instance, many municipalities have beekeeping bans of some type from outright bans on beekeeping to restrictions that make it practically impossible to keep bees even though they claim that um, they're not banning beekeeping. Um, in one city in Illinois uh, where the average lot size is 50 feet wide by 100 feet deep, uh, they, intended, they attempted to enact an ordinance requiring any beehive be at least 30 feet from any property line. Well, you can see that that would be impossible there would be only a handful of locations within this municipality where beekeeping would be possible. Um, that ordinance, uh, fortunately, uh, didn't go into effect um, and was modified, but it just shows one way that without outright banning something, uh, municipalities can essentially ban something. <laughs> um, there's a county in Illinois that has an ordinance that prevents beekeeping on lots of less than five acres if you're in an unincorporated area of the county. However, if you live, the, live in an incorporated area, a village or a city, the rules of the village or city apply. So someone who lives in an unincorporated area and has a uh, two, two and a half acre lot cannot legally keep bees. Someone who lives in a city that doesn't have an ordinance against beekeeping and lives on a one quarter acre lot with neighbors all around can legally keep bees. So sometimes you see that these ordinances uh, don't make a lot of sense. Livestock bans, many, maybe most 
Municipalities have bans on keeping various types of livestock. Most cities prohibit keeping large farm animals such as pigs and cows. Um, that's common. But many prohibit keeping any livestock with the exception of domestic pets such as cats and dogs. Some municipalities allow keeping chickens but ban roosters due to noise. Of course, that makes it difficult to raise your own chickens if you don't have a rooster. Um, and most municipalities that allow livestock have space requirements and setback distances from residences and property lines that have to be observed. Um, now, not all of these restrictions or ordinances are necessarily a bad thing. Um, for instance, this last one is primarily to ensure the health of the animals. Um, however, uh, these ordinances can be abused by the municipalities just like anything else can and they can make it uh, difficult to uh, keep any sort of animal by uh, creating ordinances that have unreasonable space requirements and that sort of thing. Um, location restrictions. It's not uncommon to encounter restrictions on where you can put a vegetable garden on your property. In residential areas, it's often against the rules, either local ordinance or homeowners association restrictions, to put a vegetable garden in the front or public space of a yard. Those sorts of things are often classed as utility areas and need to be hidden in the back, even though that may not be the best spot on the property to grow vegetables because of growing conditions, as we discussed in an earlier unit. Um, there also may be, and probably are, restrictions on the location and the height of fences um, available to be put up in residential areas. Most residential areas restrict the height of a fence um, from the building, the forward building line, to the sidewalk at three feet or less. Uh, might create an issue with security. Unkempt appearance restrictions. On the surface make a lot of sense. They're designed to prevent properties from being overgrown with weeds and becoming unsightly or eyesores and reducing property values. However, this type of restriction is much more subjective than many other ordinances and um, ordinances such as this have been used in the past uh, to limit, again, locations of vegetable gardens or even having vegetable gardens. Watering restrictions, well, this is becoming more and more common around the country. Municipalities uh, enact restrictions on how and when water can be used outdoors. Uh, some restrictions limit your watering to odd or even days based on the property address. Uh, some restrictions prevent any watering of outdoor plants. Um, and in many places, collecting rainwater runoff from roofs is illegal. Uh, the idea being that that rainwater runoff from the roof would recharge groundwater, which is a benefit to everyone, and someone taking that rainwater from the roof is preventing that benefit from being had by everyone. Processing facility requirements. This can be a big one. This one can be uh, difficult to overcome. If your product requires some type of processing, then it's likely that the facility in which you do that processing has to meet certain requirements. Here's a simple example. In Illinois, um, a law was enacted requiring certain features in honey houses where honey is extracted from the honeycomb and put into tanks, buckets, or bottles. This law would have prevented beekeepers with only a few hives from selling any honey as the requirements would have been too expensive to be worthwhile. Um, they wanted rooms that were lined with tile that where the entire room could be washed down. Um, uh, central drain facilities, um, high temperature, uh, hot water for sterilization, um, a lot of requirements like that. Um, fortunately, uh, beekeeping organizations got involved 
um, before the final law was written, and uh, they uh, were able to put in an exemption uh, for anyone who sells less than $5,000 worth of honey per year from their location. Um, virtually any meat processing, meat processing facility will have similar requirements and restrictions. In addition, meat processing facilities um, are usually restricted from anything like a residential area and have to be open for inspection. Um, even vegetables, though, can fall under this type of restriction if they're being washed and packaged. That's considered a type of processing. And depending on the location, you may have to have a special processing facility in which to do that. And then there are environmental regulations. And sometimes it seems like uh, business people are all up in arms about the restriction of environmental regulations. But in fact, most of these are, are easier to deal with um, than some of the other restrictions. Um, they're designed to protect the water, air, soil, and possibly people as opposed to protecting property values. So these are a bit more cut and dried, a bit more objective, and uh, usually enacted at the state level or the federal level, um, though sometimes counties and municipalities can also enact such regulations. Um, and they include things like restrictions on pumping water from streams or lakes for irrigation. Um, usually, if you have a flowing body of water, a creek, a stream, a river, um, you either are prohibited completely from pumping water from that flowing body for irrigation or require special permits. Um, and that can often apply to lakes that aren't completely contained within the property where they're being used for irrigation. Uh, so if any other neighboring properties border it, you often are restricted from doing any pumping. Um, there are restrictions on applying pesticides, including licensing requirements for those who apply pesticides. Now, in the case of someone applying pesticides on their own property, they're generally exempt from those restrictions. However, if you hire a worker and have that person apply pesticides, that person will need to be licensed. Um, and often if what you produce with those pesticides is sold, then you need licensing regardless of whose property it is uh, that the pesticides are being apply, uh, applied to. Um, there are also guidelines on how close to waterways that you a uh, person is allowed to plow. There are usually requirements for buffer zones uh, 50 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet, depending on the slope of the land, um, the type of waterway, that sort of thing. And then there are restrictions on discharge and runoff into waterways. So there have been times that the government has act actively promoted home gardening and urban agriculture as during the World War II Victory Garden campaign when the government promoted the idea of individuals growing their own food. And that was extremely successful. And the amount of food produced by individuals in their own gardens exceeded the amount of food being produced commercially in the country for a period of time. Um, this cartoon that's being shown here um, promotes the use of fruit preserves and jellies as sweets, uh, that sort of treat, um, in order to save sugar for sending to troops and using that sort of way. Um, there are also positive regulations. In fact, most of the regulations um, have their roots in something positive. Um, this one uh, depicts Uncle Sam checking out the claims of food and drug products. Uh, it was... Uh, a cartoon drawn to commemorate the signing of the Truth in Labeling Law signed by President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. 
Um, so there are positive aspects to these regulations. In addition to government regulation, whether ordinances, laws, that sort of thing, there are other things called socio-political issues, and they have to do with the society's involvement and perception of urban farming, including how urban farms are perceived by neighbors, whether it's a positive view. But what happens in neighborhoods when urban farms are started by those who want to teach the community? That can actually result in the people in the community being a little put off. Um, you need to be careful about these types of things. Um, and control of urban farms by corporations and the impact that that has on local communities, as opposed to, say, for instance, hiring local people, using local people to work on the farms, that may not happen. And many of these issues are tied to sort of territorial issues. Um, some things to think about. Um, as you'll see in the reading assignments and in the multimedia viewing assignments for this unit, um, there's one overarching consideration when trying to solve any political, legal, or territorial issues, not just those related to urban farming, but any issue, one overriding thing that helps more than anything else, and that's education. Educate those who are making the laws, the ordinances, the homeowners association rules about what's really going on and about the positive impact of urban agriculture and more than anything else that has the effect of helping get these things done in a positive way. Education is the key to understanding and understanding is the key to creating an environment, political, legal, environmental, that is supportive of human needs. Think of regulations against some aspect of urban farming. You know, um, anything that you may have encountered. Are those regulations based on real legitimate issues that require legislation to solve or prevent? Or are they based on a simple lack of understanding of the situation? And can education do something there? As we've mentioned in previous is, uh, units, education is one of the big positive aspects of urban agriculture, the potential for education, all kinds of education. And in dealing with these types of issues, it may be the one consideration that helps more than anything else. That concludes the presentation for this unit.